Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This is the place where we talk about that most wonderful of science fiction sub genres, steampunk. Today I am wearing my alternate outfit because I'm going to be talking about alternate history, specifically in fiction. And, and it's very related to steampunk because steampunk uses history and, and steampunks are almost by definition alternate histories, but all all alternate histories are not steampunk. So these are my ten favorite of the ones I've read, some of them rather recently, but all of them are great. And I'm going to talk about these fascinating scenarios that they present, great story opportunities. Uh, I'll start this without further ado with number ten. The Atlantropa Articles by Cody Franklin, published in 2018. Cody Franklin does a YouTube channel called the Alternate History Hub, and I've been following that for a while, and he proposes some really interesting scenarios, like what if Napoleon had won at Waterloo? What if the Bolshevik, Bolsheviks had not taken over Russia? Things like that. And so, naturally, he had to write a novel with, a, with an alternate history scenario, and this one involves a um, weird proposal, but it actually happened, for the Atl Atlantropa Project. It was proposed by a German architect, Hermann Zorgel, in the 1920s. In this, in this history, the Nazis stayed in power, and instead of invading the world, they decided to create more land in the Mediterranean for themselves. And they drained the entire thing, causing an ecological disaster. It's become this howling wasteland called the Kiln, which is because it's too hot for people to live. It's like a border, and they have to guard it with these sand ships that crawl around on tank treads with their with their military. And the lead character is a um, the captain of the Howling Dark, good name, and his name is Ansel, and his brother Ulrich comes to serve on his ship as the SS officer. It's been so long since since the Nazi era that, that they've rewritten history and Hitler is portrayed as a blue-eyed blonde and and then the SS knights are actually kind of uh, kind of chivalrous and noble, and uh, so this we have the conflict between brothers, and uh, which leads to, but it leads to tragedy, and uh, it's it's very it's kind of gripping at times, and uh, definitely fascinating. Check it out. Number nine, the break by Sean Gab, and he was writing as Richard Blake when he published this novel and a lot of his other novels, uh, published in 2014. And this is another one of these kind of time travel novels. A lot of these are, I must admit. And when I do time travel, I'm going to do a whole different set <laughs> uh, of things that are primarily time travel, rather than using it as a device. So in this, in this book, the UK in 2018, the entire island of Great Britain has been mysteriously transported back to the 11th century. Uh, and uh, all around them it's 1065, in fact in a different month and in a different time of day. <laughs> and so, and it, it's, I think it's some kind of a weird physics accident <laughs> that, that causes this. But because the government, the government's become pretty despotic and they basically hide this from the people and they don't allow anybody to know what's really going on. And so our hero is a girl named Jennifer, she's a daughter of a political dissident and smug turned smuggler who had disappeared. He was smuggling uh, drugs and technology to the uh, continent. And also Michael, who's a young emissary from Constantinople, yes, from the Byzantine Empire. <laughs> and so they have to flee the police because they're trying to catch them and flee, flee England to get to, to, get to um, Europe uh, in basically when you know, William the Conqueror was around. So it's a very, very cool and interesting premise. Wish they would have spent a little bit more time in Europe and a little bit less time with modern, modern dystopian Britain, but uh, that's just me. Number eight, 1632 by Eric Flint. Now this was an interesting thought experiment. Uh, that's, that's my understanding of why he wrote it. And in this story, a West Virginia town called Grantville from the year 2000, is transported mysteriously back, mysteriously back in time and over in space 
to Germany in 1632. I guess the premise is that aliens did this as kind of an experiment or perhaps even a prank, hard to say. <clears throat> but of course, this splits off the timeline and the universe that, that Granville op, uh, occupies now in uh, Europe is split off from what really happens in our timeline to create Granville in the first place. So they have to, they have to make allies and uh, and uh, deal with the characters in that in that time, uh, people like um, uh, Cardinal Richelieu and uh, Oliver Cromwell and Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden. They basically start the United States of Europe <laughs> in a very rah rah can do spirit, and all the people in the town are, are protagonists. And uh, but I remember in particular this one school teacher who's important because she knows history and because she understands what's going on here. And it spawned a whole series of books by uh, Flint and other authors. I think there's at least five in the main timeline, timeline and there's at least ten exploring alternate uh, things happening in other areas besides Grantville. Number seven, The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead, 2016. Now, when I heard about this, I heard it was a I heard it was steampunk, and I'm not sure I would really call it a steampunk um, because it's it's doesn't have airships or or goggles or things like that, but it does have some uh, 19th century technology in there, and in this this happens in the antebellum bellum South before the Civil War, in which the Underground Railroad is a literal railroad built underground, and that's how these slaves are escaping bondage. And it involves two slaves, um, Cora and her male companion Caesar, who are getting away from this really brutal plantation in Georgia. And they come to South Carolina, which has freed their slaves, but they have kind of like a, this sinister thing happening. So we have this alternate, alternate exploration of what the states do to uh, what the states do to handle this problem of slavery, and. Uh, the slave catchers are after after them. Cora ends up in North Carolina, which is even worse because they've basically sold all their slaves, replaced them with Irish laborers, and uh, blacks are forbidden by pain of death to enter the state. So you know she has to hide away and so on. So it's it's got some really fascinating uh, alt history takes. You know if, to see if Cora will escape, and eventually, you know we have some utopian uh, communal movements of freed slaves in the north that she hopes to get to. Definitely definitely good with a very good period feel and language to it. Number six, Kingdom of the Wicked by Helen Dale, published 2017. Actually it's two books called, the first one called Rules and the second one called Order. And in this scenario, the uh, Industrial Revolution happened in the early days of the Roman Empire, and they have got aircraft, they've got computers, they've got television, in fact, they even have some genetic engineering, so they're in some ways ahead of us. But they, but they are um, basically, this is the time of Jesus. And so, it asks the questions, what would happen to Jesus in, uh, if we had a modern state in, in uh, Palestine at that time? And of course, he'd be tried for terrorism. So we have a lot of uh, characters, historical characters, Pontius Pilate, Judas Iscariot. Pontius is a pretty, Pilate's a pretty um, sympathetic character because although the empire is kind of despotic, it's also become rather benign. In fact, they've outlawed slavery. And so, so you find a lot of sympathy for the Romans. It's definitely, definitely a pretty interesting read. And uh, I highly recommend it. Number five, I just finished this one recently, Empire of Lies by Raymond Corey, published 2019. Here's an alternate history in which the gallant defenders of Vienna in 1683, which happened in real history, they get basically defeated by the, by the uh, armies of the Sultan of, of the, the Turkish Sultan of the Ottoman Empire because the, the Ottomans actually pull a suicide bombing <laughs> to destroy the leaders like King John of Poland and so on who led the Europeans to victory. And as a, as a result, the Ottomans end up taking over all of continental Europe 
you know, excluding Russia. And they, uh, in, in the 21st century, uh, Europe is Muslim and it's ruled in very much of an old-fashioned way with public executions and so on. And, uh, and you know, sultans running around with turbans. <laughs> and we, we uh, focus on a member of the Turkish secret police, Kemal, who is a very idealistic guy trying to prevent terrorist attacks from uber, from uber, uber fundamentalist Muslims. And uh, he discovers he discovers this naked man, mysterious naked man, who's found in the Seine. This is Paris. <laughs> this is Ottoman Paris. And uh, he's taken to the hospital, and he's covered with tattoos, and he's the the um, the uh, key to a secret history of what, how this happened, which involves surprise, surprise, time travel. <laughs> so we have some time travel, but we have some really, really great feel of, of a different world view and uh, completely fascinating. Number four, Guns of the South by Harry Turtledove, published 1992. And this takes, this is of course, as you would figure, has to do with the, the famous war between the states. And as the Confederacy is losing ground and uh, facing future de defeat by the Union, some mysterious figures approach General Robert E. Lee with this gun, with this fabulous gun that can fire bullets at a rapid pace. It turns out it's an AK-47, by the way. And they teach uh, Lee and his people to how to manufacture these, the, this gun, which allows them to tur turn the tide and win against the Union. But Lee also discovered that these people are time travelers. From, they are neo-Nazis from... Um, post-apartheid South Africa who want to, you know, make the world safe for white supremacy. And so he realizes he can't have these people running his country. And also, he's always, he was always anti-slavery, so he, he basically wants to solve the problem of slavery and produce some sort of emancipation. So it's got a very, very great, it's very, very wonderfully researched, you, the, the language and the technology of war makes you feel like you're there. And uh, this book, um, Turtle Dove followed this up with a whole slew of novels in this timeline in which the, the USA and the CSA fight on different sides of the two world wars. And I only read one additional one of these, but if you like alt history, Turtle Dove is the man. He's really a master of that, of that genre. Number three, Warlord of the Air. Now I've talked about this in my steampunk top 10 yeah, but it bears repeating even even though you know even though Moorcock and I have some serious differences he once called he once called Tolkien a crypto fascist but nonetheless this is a very a well imagined uh, very well imagined alternate present from the 1970s and what what we have is a British army officer Oswald Bastable from a right around 1900, gets mysteriously transported into the future of 1972, where he, uh, where he meets, um, where he encounters this utopian future, where the British Empire still rules, and we still have the Russian Empire, the American America still rules the Philippines, and so on, and uh, and this timeline, um, we have great airships uh, flying the world skies ferry people around, and, you know, Bastable can't tell people what really happened. They'll think he's crazy, but he takes a job, because of his experience, he takes a job as an airship steward, and uh, things are great until he gets fired and uh, takes up with this tramp steamer airship of radicals, and here he discovers that things aren't as rosy, that people are dissatisfied in the colonies, and he goes to meet the titular warlord, Xu Ho Ti, trying to, who is trying to liberate China from its colonial masters, and has a very interesting ending. And there's two additional books in this series, which I have not yet read, but I do intend to at some point. Number two, The Yiddish Policeman's Union by Michael Chabon, 2008. And uh, this is an alternate history in which uh, the state of Israel failed. Uh, it was overrun by the Arabs right, right away in 1948. But the Jews did have a homeland in Sitka, Alaska. 
and this was based on a real-life proposal by Harold Ickes, who was FDR's Interior Secretary, a uh, proposal from 1939 to, to resettle the Jews from Germany into there. And unfortunately, you know, it would, if it would have happened, a lot of people would have been saved from the Holocaust. Now, in this world, uh, it's taking place, I believe, right around the turn of our century, and where the time is just about up, because this was for a limited time, and the uh, district of Sitka is going to revert into the state of Alaska, and all of the residents will either have to apply for citizenship or leave, and once again become the wandering Jew. So this is this looming over their heads, and while this is happening, we have Meyer Landsman, the troubled homicide detective, who's it's got a very noir feel. This book, he's investigating a murder of one of one of his neighbors in the Zamenhof Hotel. In the process, he uncovers a really sinister, a really sinister conspiracy, which is something that plausibly could be happening in our timeline, but I won't give it away. But it's got some fascinating characters, including, uh, you know, Landsman's boss and ex-wife, and his cousin, who is also on the force, who is, he's half, he's half Native American and half Jewish, <laughs> so he, he doesn't really fit in anywhere. Uh, so, we've got this, we've got this sardonic humor and this fantastic, all these, all this Yiddish, in this background to Yiddish culture, very, very cool. Number one, this is the the numero uno, the most successful alternate history of all time. Uh, the Man in the High Castle by Philip K. Dick, the great, the troubled, and uh, a genius, troubled genius sci-fi writer who died in the 1980s. But this was written in 1962, published, uh, and it takes place in 1962, in an alternate history in which, in which the, um, the FDR was assassinated in 1934, and thus, the U.S. didn't get in the war soon enough, and the Axis powers won. And they defeated the United States and divided it between the U.S., between Germany and Japan, with like a buffer zone in the Rocky Mountains. <clears throat> anyway, um, one of the things I like, as, as the, being the weeaboo that I am, I like how the Japanese are the good guys. They uh, have become less oppressive. Some of, the, some of the generals that were responsible for things like... Um, the rape of Nanking were tried and thrown out, and whereas they're so they're still oppressive, but they're they're much less bad than the Nazis, and so this involves some people that were living on the West Coast who are looking for this. They're looking for this mysterious author from the Rocky Mountain area um, called Hawthorne Ab Abinson, and he wrote this alt historical novel called *The Grasshopper Lies Heavy*, in which History full proceeded like our time, and the Allies won. And uh, he supposedly lives in this fortress in Cheyenne, Wyoming, hence the name Man in the High Castle. There was all this conspiracy and all this uh, jockeying, the Germans plotting to destroy the Japanese so they can rule the world alone. So I know I've gone on too long, but I had to wax eloquent on my favorite, my favorite um, alt history novels, and. Uh, so let me know what you think about this in the comments below. Uh, and uh, please like and subscribe so it allows us to do more of this and to keep getting the good word of steampunk out to the masses. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.